Okay, so I'm one of those people who use both the LS and the cross-sectional data. And during those talks, I was thinking I should have really put more of the cross-sectional stuff in, which I haven't. So sorry about that. I'll try and like slip it in as we're going through. Um, but so I'm a population officer currently lecturing at the University of Liverpool, and all of the experience I've had since using the LS, I can kind of attribute a lot of it to that learning curve and that familiarity, familiarity with those kind of data. Um, and that kind of has led to different collaborations, such as with Matt, as he previously suggested, but also experiences using big data overseas, which I'll touch on a little bit. So it's kind of, it's good to use for your research and any kind of output you want to produce, but also, as Matt said, it's really useful for your career. Um, but it is, it doesn't happen how you plan it. So that's my kind of opening slide to say, this is your idea, whether it's your PhD, your research project, whatever. You start thinking, yep, yeah, I'm going to get there. And then this happens. It might be a volcano here or something as well, but eventually you will get there. So hopefully that's how you'll feel. So an overview, what I'm going to do today is talk about selective sorting. So that's the key concepts that I was looking into. And then talk more about the census microdata. So what kind of things can you do with these different data types? Um, but then really focusing on what I did with the LS rather than cross-sectional data. And then talking more about how those experiences helped me use other data in different contexts. So that is where I talk about different journeys. So it's my little journey, starting off at Leeds, then going to Queen Mary here in London, via University of Auckland, and now at Liverpool where I am now. And all of that has kind of so much to do with the experiences I had using the census microdata and the LS. So this is a kind of this is an overview of my thesis. So these are the kind of the methods that I use, the objectives that I had, and the data sets that I addressed. And so I didn't just use census microdata. I was um, perhaps a little foolishly ambitious and also tried to stick in the health service for England, which I did, and it was good, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So that was one data set that we're not going to focus on. But all of the different objectives that I had could be addressed using the samples of anonymized records, like other I still call it the SARS rather than census microdata, um, and the ONS longitudinal studies. And you can use these data sets to get at different angles of the same picture, which is what I'm going to talk about as we go through, using similar methods, whether it's something like standardised illness ratios or logistic regression, and looking at how these um, different measures can be used to illuminate different aspects of ethnic inequalities in health, which is what I was really interested in, under the guise of the concept of selective sorting, which is what I will talk more about today. So the focus is really going to be on how I use the LS, but I will touch on other aspects as moving forward. So, before I talk more about that data and what I did with it, what is selective sorting and why do we care about it? And Matt kind of touched on this a little bit in this idea of selection effects with international migrants. But I was interested in selection effects going on with internal movers, or perhaps also in terms of social mobility. So we know that the population is selectively sorted, this selective sorting idea, into different life circumstances. And that can be through migration at various different scales, or we can think about it in terms of residential mobility, or we can think about it in terms of social mobility. And typically, these processes, these sorting processes, are sort of in distinct ways. So you kind of either talk about social mobility, or you talk about residential mobility or migration. But they're interlinked. People will often move house in tandem with some kind of change in their social circumstances. So they are related to each other. We know it's selective as opportunities for migration or social mobility will vary depending on our own individual level circumstances. So your socioeconomic status, also the area in which you live, so the kind of opportunities that are available to you, both in terms of education, labour market, or the kind of further areas you might move to. But it's also selective on ethnicity and on health. So those are the key things that I was looking at. 
What I was then interested in is how this process of selective sorting might contribute to health inequalities and whether that's going to operate differently for different ethnic groups. So the core idea is that the movement of differently healthy groups between area types and social classes might influence the health profile of those different areas or of those different social classes. And then, does that happen differently for different ethnic groups? And the core idea is, is this selective sorting, could it be contributing to changing health gradients? Is it leading to them to widen? Is it just maintaining them as they are? Or is it narrowing them, constraining them? So that's the idea that I was looking into with these different data. So why census my data? I'm not going to go into this in great detail because a lot of it is coming through all the presentations we're already having. But we know that we have these different data sets and we can look back to 1971. So with the cross-sectional data, this is from 1991, 2001 and 2011. And this is good and different from the LS because you have much larger sample sizes. So you can still look at relevant issues in terms of ethnic inequalities, in terms of migration, in terms of um, health and that granularity of ethnic detail, but you can't do it in a linked way. So you have the full coverage of census variable, and if you're identifying migrants, all you're doing is using a one-year migration indicator. So in that census, in that data you have, it says, is your current address different from one year prior? And within that, then you can identify people who have moved to the UK in the last year, or have moved within the UK in the last year, or who are stayers, so haven't moved. And you can have that at 91, 2001, and 2011. So that allows you to look at one aspect of this um, picture. Then you have the longitudinal data. So this is the 1% sample, so it's much smaller, so you have different kind of benefits, but you can actually follow people through time. So you can see that as people move, what is it actually doing to health gradients between different area types or social classes, rather than just looking at associations between the health status of movers and non-movers, for example. So again, you have the full coverage of census variables, but your migrants, rather than a one-year migration question, are now identified by a 10-year migration indicator. So is the address different from 10 years prior? So you're getting different angles of the same story. And what I was interested in is these closed cohorts of people, so people who are present at the 1991 and 2001 census, or at the 2001 and 2011 census. And this adds in loads of other questions, particularly when you're comparing it to existing work, for example, is a 10-year time period enough to look at these health differences? Should we be looking at a 20-year time period? What happens if you go back to 1971? All these different issues. So with the LS, and this is separate from what we did with the SARS. So with the SARS, I was really just looking at associations. So modelling health outcomes for movers compared to non-movers for different ethnic groups. But here, there are three main approaches. So you could compare gradients. You could say, what are the health gradients by deprivation, which is what I was looking at for different area types, for people who have moved and people who have remained in the same place. If you say, okay, the population is all allowed to move, you're letting them be mobile, what does the deprivation gradient look like for health? But what happens if you then put that population back to where they started? Did you see that that movement meant that the gradient from the most to the least surprised area widened inequalities along that gradient? Did it maintain them or did it constrain them? And you can calculate that by looking at the ratio, rate ratio between the most and least surprised areas. Another way of thinking about this, instead of just comparing the gradients, is actually looking at the health status of people transitioning. If you move into or out of the least deprived areas, if you move into or out of the most deprived areas, what is that doing to the overall health gradient? So it's quite complicated, quite a lot of things to be holding on to. But thinking here then, so if you have movers, migrants and stayers, but you also have people whose area type might have changed, even if they haven't, and what is that combined influence of people moving between area types or the area type changing on overall health gradients that you see? But both of these scenarios are really just interested in the top and the bottom of the deprivation gradient. And that kind of forgets everything that's going on in the middle, which is where most of us reside anyway. So another way to look at it then is calculating the slope index of inequality and the relative index of inequality. Again, thinking about what happens if people move and what happens if people don't move. So don't worry about grasping all the kind of intricacies of this. This is just kind of showcasing the kind of different things that you can do with these data. So a few conclusions. So first of all, that first analytical approach. So we have, for 
2001 and 1991 period and the 2001 to 2011 period, and you're comparing two gradients. You're comparing health status um, at the end of that study period, so either 2001 or 2011, by where people live in 1991 or 2001, so the start of the study period, with the health gradient as it is where they live at the end of the study period. And you want to know what is the gradient, what is the difference, what is that rate ratio for when people stay where they are or when people move. So, just to kind of make it clear, this dark bar is what happens, is the health status by where they end up, by their destination deprivation quintile. The lighter bar is where they started. So does the movement appear to widen, narrow or constrain health gradients? In this case, it appears that movement allowing people to move when they move between deprivation quintiles over this 10-year period, it could contribute to widening health inequalities. You see that the difference between the most deprived and least deprived has widened. So that's one way of looking at it, and that is our conclusion A. Health gradients by deprivation are steeper when groups move within and between deprivation quintiles than occur when the population is put back into their origin quintile. So movement is appearing to exaggerate health gradients. But how is that happening? So if we take the example again of 1991 to 2001, or 2001 to 2011, and I'm going to try and walk through this, I know we're going far, and try and walk through this with the 2001 to 2011 example, but what you have here is you have the standardised illness ratio for different transitions. So people who remain in the least deprived area, people who move into the least deprived area, people who move out of the least deprived area, people who remain in the middle, people who move um, out of the most deprived area, people who move into the most deprived area, and people who remain in the most deprived area. And the first thing to notice is that the best health is with people who remain in the least deprived area, the worst health is with people who remain in the most deprived area. And that's true for um, both time periods. But then what we're interested in is what happens for movers and stayers, so stayers and perhaps areas change, and what's going on with the standardised illness ratio. For this movement to be contributing to widening health inequalities, all that you need to see is that the people moving into the least deprived areas have better health, not significantly, just better health than the people moving out of the least deprived areas, and that the people moving into the most deprived areas need to have poorer health than the people moving out of them. So it doesn't need to be a significant difference for it to start playing out in this way. All that needs to happen is that you see that difference, and you do. With the stayers, what you're seeing is a slightly different um, scenario. And this kind of different pattern here perhaps suggests that this movement or this change in area is at best maintaining existing health gradients. It's not necessarily constraining it. So conclusion B, transitions into and out of Q1 and Q5, so at least the most deprived by movers, could be contributing to widening health gradients. And movers churning within the least deprived areas are in better health than stayers who remain in the least deprived areas. And movers churning within the most deprived areas have poorer health than stayers who remain. So there's still something going on there with movers and how they move within or between those differently deprived areas. So then we see the same thing but with a slope index inequality. And you're just getting the same patterns but you're seeing that actually you see the movement of these kind of differently healthy groups across all of the deprivation quintiles matters for this change in health gradient. So just to kind of show you what this meant for future research and give an idea of why it's a benefit to use this data but not just for your current ideas, but to kind of give you that learning curve. And as Matt said, once you've, once you've got to grips with the LS, anything else seems relatively okay. And that is definitely true. If you do have a lot of support from the Celsius team, but it's, it's not easy. And trying to understand how it fits together means that once you've done it with these data, you can go to New Zealand, you can be there for five weeks, and you can get three papers out of it. So it's just like, that's good. And you'll be able to do that having got to grips with these different data sources. And actually, using these data, which is big data, connect, um, linking administrative records, it's just, it's so much easier to understand why they matter, so much easier to start applying different um, models. So I took the framework that I've done with LS and started looking at this, but instead of with general health, looking at this for residential mobility over a much richer time period and looking specifically at cardiovascular disease for different ethnic groups in New Zealand, so Maori, Pacific, New Zealand, Europeans. And you get 
the same kind of stories, which is always a good thing. You're seeing consistency in different data sets, um, but you're seeing it in di playing out in different ways. And you can do different analyses having got that grounding in the longitudinal data that you might have used in the LS. So this case is using trajectory analysis and cluster analysis to start thinking, okay, in the LS you can say 91, 2001, and 2011, you have three time points. In these data, I had 36 calendar quarters. So you can analyze residential mobility and the relationship with health outcomes in a very different way. This isn't really showing much detail. This is just a highlight that it's beneficial to use the LS and you get different experience and you can start using things, applying your same framework in different contexts, such as New Zealand, or perhaps you could go to Scotland or Northern Ireland and think about the same thing. And you get that experience and the teams that you collaborate with that is a real benefit. Oh, and I have to put that up. No, not that one. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Sharon, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to make sure you So what this is trying to look at is the idea that there are lots of reasons why inequalities change. There's lots of mechanisms going on that are driving changing health gradients. And looking at this was just, it, this is a kind of, this was a relatively underexplored area, the way that movement between area types contributes to these changing health gradients. There is quite a lot of literature on it, but it's still relatively underexplored, and it hasn't been looked at specifically in terms of ethnicity. And given that different ethnic groups have really different socioeconomic experiences, live in very different areas, have very different kind of historical trajectories in the UK, let alone their own individual trajectories. So it's the fact, the idea that could this relatively underexplored issue explain things differently for different ethnic groups. And what I found was that these processes did tend to play out across all ethnic groups. I didn't go into showing you for every single ethnic group that I did because there isn't time, and the patterns were largely the same. But then there were some interesting things. For example, with the Indian, within the Indian group, there was a very, very high amount of inequality and the contribution of these movements between area types and social classes at the same time had an important impact. Yeah, and what would you think the UK's housing market has contributed to some, some of the selective kind of migration from the different groups and the social classes of ethnic groups? Yeah, so the, the, particularly breaking it down by ethnic groups and starting to try and think, okay, how are these different groups moving? Where ethnic groups have settled in the UK kind of shapes their access to the labour market, housing market, education sector. So that will then have a knock-on effect on how and where people move. So you see and saw it in the UK and in New Zealand, certain ethnic groups are much more likely to be churning within the most deprived areas. And this has a really important implication for their health system. So if people are constrained within a certain area but also having to be more mobile, we have to start looking in more detail at what that nature of that move is and what is affecting it. I think quite a lot for certain groups. I think the, the kind of the positive moves are generally across bigger scales and that are captured in small areas. But it's these people who are churning and moving a lot in, in kind of precarious housing tenures, perhaps in precarious employment. Um, they're the ones that are suffering. And I think that policy, when you're thinking about how to address these inequalities, should be area-based, but also really focusing on those at-risk groups who are vulnerable to move a lot. Um, I, I think that that small scale is important to that, but it depends on the area. So it's not going to be true everywhere. <coughs> if you've got somewhere, if you've got somewhere with a very um, concentrated private rental sector, this is probably more likely an issue. If you've just got a social rented or owner-occupied sector, it's not going to have the same impact. Any questions? Um, can we go back to the last slide? Um, you can this one. What you have here is so that, yeah, these are the time points that we've over, and these are seven clusters of people moving in different ways 
through deprivation. So, for example, are people um, moving into more deprived areas or are they kind of going like that the, across the deprivation spectrum? Are they starting off at kind of less deprived and then moving down into most deprived? So it's instead of saying that when you're, which is what you can do with ALS, all you can really do is say this is the difference in deprivation between two quite large time points, which is still very informative, as I found. But here you can say, okay, what characterises more detailed deprivation for these people who are churning? Are they churning around quintiles four and five, for example? And what does that do for their final health risk? So that's what this is showing. You see, we identified seven trajectories of move. That's what I've done here. I guess my question is how do you who were movers and deprivation and they kind of move between different deprivation quintiles but then also um, stayers so these this black pale bar here is people whose area has changed during that time period right, and so they, so haven't, moved, but they haven't moved but their area has changed and the time scale at which you look at that really matters as you would expect sort of like lag effects and all that kind of thing um, but here you do see different patterns for the movers but there's still an overall impact on health inequalities that gets stronger the longer the time period you look 